<coughs> so first, let me just express what an immense joy it is to be here again at Pusey House. Over the last years, I have been working quite quite often. I've been coming here working on a book on Anglo-Catholicism, which I hope to present to Swedish readers. Um, I have always felt I've been so well taken care of at this place. And now when traveling is uh, possible, uh, it is good to be back here. And I'm glad to have the opportunity to tell you a little about a man with whom I've spent quite a lot of time. Max Turion, brother of the ecumenical community of Tessy in France, and an ecumenical theologian. I have written uh, my PhD at the University of Uppsala and it's now seven years since I defended my thesis um, and after that it has been translated into English and I think uh, well I know it, it's possible to get it to see it in the library and I also have um, some copies with me if anyone would be interested. Um, uh, the the book, like this, um, and um, it is a presentation, among other things, of a passionate ecumenist and brother of the community of TC, Max Turion. Among Swedish colleagues, most of them would not know of Max Turion, but I am convinced that almost all of my colleagues in the Church of Sweden, at least, know of the community of TC and many of them have been to Tessé, as it is so very popular for young Christians in Sweden to go there on pilgrimage. And that was also, and that has been going on for some time, so I have myself been a young pilgrim there uh, in my teenage, uh, and after that as well. The ecumenical community of Tessé today gathers crowds of teenagers and young adults who take part in what is described as a pilgrimage for reconciliation. It is um, considered to be both as a religious community and as a place for pilgrimage for Christians from different churches and denominations practice ecumenism as they worship together and as they share their experience of their Christian journey. In latter years, Tessé has also been a place for interreligious encounters as meeting between people of different faiths has gathered there. Um, my studies of uh, Max Turion has made me acquainted with the early start of the Tessy community uh, as an expression of how Christians from the Reformed churches sought to renew monastic life and also sought to find a closer fellowship with other Christian, not least with the Roman Catholic Church, in a way that wasn't possible before. If Max Turion would have lived today, he would be 100 years old. And this circumstance makes it possible to name the speech of today as a centenary lecture. <laughs> and I would like to structure this lecture thus, that I um, will start first to present Max Turion, then say something of my book about him, um, and in a way that reflects the title that's given to this lecture, Seeking Catholic Unity uh, as an Ecumenical Vision. And last, I will reflect on some challenges Turion's theology leads to a new generation of ecumenists. I think I might go on something like 40 minutes or so, and uh, I, I hope for your patience, but uh, well, if there is something you want to know, you could, you could interrupt me, or, or maybe there will be a chance for, for questions afterwards as well. So Max Turion lived from 1921 to 1996. He is from Switzerland. He's a theologian. Her both deals with what can be called a claim of Catholicity for the church to which one belongs, while at the same time talking about the possibility to recognize Catholicity in other churches and denominations. And I think that has some similarities with what an Anglo-Catholic would do. To, to defend the Catholic, and to make a claim of Catholicity for, for the Church of England, but also engage in an um, ecumenical dialogue with others as recognizing 
but it does not not only belong to a church that can be said to be Catholic, but also that the church uh, can be recognized in other churches and denominations, not being um, not, not being the entire Church of Christ, but a part of it, and in itself incomplete. Um, when I ask theologians what they know about Max Turion, they also know of him. There are three things that can be mentioned, and the first thing we'll say is that he belonged to the Brotherhood of the Ecumenical Community of TC, that is known. But also, some people know that he has been both the brain and the pen behind the document Baptist Eucharist Ministry, the BEM document that was accepted by Faith and Order as they, in 1982, met in Lima in Peru. Turion is also known uh, for the rather controversial move of his that he made later in his life in becoming a Roman Catholic. This was controversial as TC brothers did not see individual conversions as the way to, reconcil to reconciliation with the Catholic Church. Rather, they explored the possibility of a double church membership, a double appartenance, to be able to enter into communion with the Catholic Church without denouncing the tradition in which they were brought up. Turion is a theologian whose life in many ways is intertwined with the ecumenical movement in the 20th century. So he lived from 1921 to 1996, so it's a time that really is a time where ecumenism was very at the core. Uh, Turion was born in Geneva in a, in a reformed family. They were not regular churchgoers, but he had a pious grandmother who had a great impact on him, on him and who encouraged him uh, to study theology with the theme of becoming a pastor. He has said um, other things about his grandmother that she taught him the doctrine of the real presence as she explained to him what it was like to go to communion. She says, it's Jesus who comes to me. As a student, uh, Turion got involved with what could be called a reformed high church movement within reformed churches in Switzerland called Eglise et Liturgie, that means church and liturgy. It was a movement stressing the Catholicity of the Reformation. They worked with liturgical renewal and hoped for the restoration of Christian unity. It was in this milieu as um, um, the very young Max Turion met Roger Schütz, who became Brother Roger, the first prior of the community of Tessé. And he joined him in his plan to found a Protestant monastery. And due to the war, even though uh, Brother Roger had found this, um, and bought a little house in the village of Tessé, near um, Cluny and Citeaux, and Cluny, who was a very he was once in history a, a, a monastic centre, but due to the war it was difficult for them to go there. So they started their community life in Geneva and were allowed to say the office is in the, the Cathedral de Saint-Pierre, the St. Peter's Church in Geneva, where Calvin once teach, but in the, in the choir they said the daily offices. Um, using the, 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 the breviary that was composed by this Église et Liturgie. But after the war, they were able to go to Tessé. And 1949, uh, Brother Roger and Brother Max, together with uh, another group of young men, made their uh, perpetual monastic vows. Um, Turion had been uh, ordained a pastor in, his, um, in, in Geneva, and he was his role in the Tessé community was, among other things, to uh, to, to, to be responsible for its liturgical life. <coughs> and as we said, it was, and that, we, 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 that was probably that kind of bit that you experienced when you were there in the 1970s. If now to see is known for its shots and, the, and, the, and this very special type of services, but they, but Max Turion, um, uh, he produced um, a, an office book, and also order for the celebration of um, the Eucharist. And, um, 
and it was quite radical what he did from a, uh, from, from a reformed perspective where, where, where the role of the Eucharist was quite limited at that time and he sought inspiration in, in the early church for constructing a liturgy and um, the book Eucharistia Tese, Eucharist from 1959 could easily be seen as a forerunner to the uh, Roman Catholic bars as it has been um, done in the, in, uh, after the Second Vatican Council, uh, as well as it is done in Anglican churches and Lutheran churches and other churches today. Um, in many ways, the young Turian expresses similarities, what in our context could be named high church, um, as he was interested in in the liturgical life, in the uh, stressing the dogmas, the, con the historical continuity of the church. But he also writes a number uh, of books intending to present um, a Catholic understanding manifested in the Reformed tradition. He could say that if you look at Calvin and if you look at Luther, you can find things that you may not uh, believe is there because it's not practiced so today. Alongside with the endeavors described above, uh, he became very early in his life involved in uh, the ecumenical movement. Uh, first, uh, he already as a student of theology, he joined Group de Dombe or Group of Le Dombe. It's a group of uh, Roman Catholic priests and Calvinist pastors from France and from French-speaking Switzerland. And they met every year in the old Cistercian Abbey of Le Dombe under the leadership of Abbe Paul Couturier, uh, who also is famous for starting the Octave for Christian Unity in its present form. Um, and the group of Le Dombe exists still, and they have produced ecumenical texts of conversions uh, on a number of issues. This group have no, shall we say, official state, just as their members have no authority from the respective <coughs> churches, but other ecumenical dialogues have drawn inspiration from the text of Group of Le Dombe. And uh, another early ecumenical engagement of Brother Max Turian was that he, together with his prior Rosicius, was invited to be one of the ecumenical observers at the Second Vatican Council. So all during his session they were living in a group of Tessie brothers in Rome and having an open house and meeting the, 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 the fathers of the councils uh, and, uh, and uh, other person, people, they become friends, just like the, 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 the young advisor to uh, Joseph Ratzinger, who we have a doctoral student here who's writing his thesis on the theology of Joseph Ratzinger. Um, so he, he was very much aware and in contact with the developments of the Second Vatican Council that really <coughs> constitutes a new opening in um, the ecumenical dialogues. Uh, Turion was also involved in the work of the Faith and Order in the World Council of Churches, and he has, um, and I think his career there was crowned with him as its secretary. Um, uh, to, to, to produce and publish the BEM document. And after launching this BEM document, that was, it was a, a document, not so big, but, but trying to express how could Christians from different churches and den denomination say together what we believe is, is the role of baptism, uh, your Christian ministry. Of course, also addressing what are the, the, the questions that need to have a further dialogue on, but um, it, it was of immense importance and the, and, and the important point in, in the um, ecumenical uh, dialogue on dogmatic and issues and issues of church life. Um, and when this, after the, this had been uh, accepted, this then document, Turian worked for some years together with the Methodist scholar Jeffrey Wainwright with the reception of this important document. So even if the BEM document is is, um, uh, sm is not so big, it's not a big book, 
the, the books that are next to it in, the, in, the, in a bookshop that shows responding to them is are, are, are very uh, and it's an interesting documentation and I think I have thought this that if Max Turiog had uh, died 10 years before he did or something he would be having remembered solely as an ecumenical hero bringing trying to bring the unity of the church closer. But as I said, um, <clears throat> Max Turion became a Roman Catholic and that was, uh, that came as a shock to many of his colleagues and also to his friends at the community of Tessé as that was not their idea of, uh, of bringing about Christian unity, rather it was to search a sort of that the churches were united as a whole, and and, um, and it was a little special because Turian didn't tell so many people about it, and it was a little secret. So it was a journalist who saw him celebrating mass with some Roman Catholic sisters, and we asked, "But are, are you?" And the journalist was, "Are you a Roman Catholic priest?" And he said, "Yes." And then it was no. I think one year after his being ordained a Roman Catholic priest, and it. And that also made a certain conflict with, I think, with the community of Tessie. On the other hand, uh, Brother Roger uh, never became a Roman Catholic, but it was, um, as you might remember, that at the funeral of John Paul II, uh, the, uh, some, some was uh, astonished the fact that Brother Roger received communion from uh, Cardinal Ratzinger at that uh, funeral. Uh, and that was, um, uh, but it's said that Brother Rogers, so to say, made a sort of profession of the Catholic faith to a Roman Catholic bishop, but not, but without denouncing, nor his his being a, a, a pastor of his church, nor the, the faith where he comes. So it was a sort of private figure. So he received the sacraments in the Roman Catholic Church all his life, and it was actually had a, had a Roman Catholic burial conducted by Cardinal Walter Casper. But he was. Um, a reformed pastor, I think. So, so I can say that Max Turion became a Roman Catholic in his own way, and uh, uh, Brother Roger Schütz did not become a Roman Catholic in his own way. Um, uh, but um, I don't really know what was the reason that Max Turion took that step. I mean, as I will show when I present some of his writings, he, he, his position in many ways came closer to a Roman Catholic. Uh, Position, but I think there were things that happened in in the reform in one of the reformed churches in in Switzerland, and uh, he was trying. He was advising them all the time to introduce the office of the bishop and uh, <coughs> invite <coughs> bishops from other churches to to join it. And what happened that it was a lay person who was made the leader of, of the chairman of the church, and that person conducted ordinations without being ordained himself or herself. I don't know if it was a man or a woman, but it was, uh, that might have been something that provoked him that the church was going in a very different direction for what he had hoped for and also what the, uh, what the vision of the Ben document was the same. But Max Turion, when I met him in, in Rome, he, he was, um, he was a Roman Catholic priest and I asked him, where do you live nowadays? And he said, Naples, Rome, Geneva, and Tessie. So, yeah, so he was, uh, but, but he was ordained in the cathedral of Naples and, uh, and made a canon there. And, but he also was a theological advisor to Pope John Paul II. And um, some says, if I have heard a rumor, that he was very much involved in helping the Pope making his uh, encyclical letter on ecumenism, Ut Unum Sint from 1995. True or not, um, he seems to at last, to some extent, has encouraged the ecumenical spirit within the Roman Catholic Church, still not challenges the exclusivity of some aspects of Roman Catholic ecclesiology. He died in 1996, and he is buried in the grave next to Brother Roger in Tessier. And this uh, sketch of Turian's life demonstrates that he, in his authorships, goes through three periods 
uh, that reflects different nuances in his writing, and that's one of the results of my book. I call them a, a high church reformed theology at first, then an ecumenical theology, and then, lastly, an ecumenically open Roman Catholicism. And that was the first uh, thing I said, and now to the book. I've, I try to analyze the, um, uh, the writings of Turian Booth, looking on this historical development, but also trying to um, analyze um, um, his, um, his thoughts. And I'm looking, and the book, I, I, I look on Turian's understanding on five um, themes in his theology, and that is baptism, Eucharist, ministry, the three um, themes that are present in the BAM document, and three themes that are seen as important themes to agree on when churches are searching to, to unite and come closer to one another. These three, but I also start the, the papacy, the patrine, trine ministry, and the Mariology, as those two issues are sometimes seen as controversial in relations between um, Roman Catholics and Christians from the Reformed churches. And my methodological approach that consists in that the idea that for churches to enter into full communion, it is required that they can recognize Catholicity in one another's churches, and that this mutual recognition can be the ground for what I call Catholic unity. As I interpret Turian's text on these issues, or practices as I call them, I define that recognition of Catholicity, it can be recognized as either applied Catholicities, that is that the churches can affirm mutually that they both demonstrate Catholicity in the doctrine and their life, or one can talk about created Catholicity, that means that through reforms and changes in the churches, they can make it possible for this recognition in a way that earlier was not possible. I note that in Turian's text, he is primarily concerned with the relation between Reformed churches and, Roman, and the Roman Catholic Church. But I think that the method I see in his text and the method he used can be useful within other ecumenical dialogues. Catholic unity is also a term I use in my dissertation. It's a description of that unity that can be accomplished when divided churches can recognize Catholicity in one another's churches. Um, the Catholic unity I described is similar to the term visible unity, saying that unity is not a peaceful toleration of, um, uh, of different opinions and practices, but it is a unity manifested in mutually recognized orders full Eucharistic community and commonly accepted ways of exercising authority in the church. Turian do when, and, and just say something short on each of these themes, there are lots of things to say about, um, but first Turian do when he speaks about baptism, uh, talk about the fact that baptism is mutually recognized among most of the historical churches and shows that baptism is not only a fact uh, that, well, well, the fact that we recognize one another as Baptist means more that we don't rebaptize people who, who enters another church. No, it's, it's more than that. It's Christ is at work through his spirit in the churches that baptizes. And the spirit given to the baptized is a force that draw them and encourages them to work for the restoration of Christian unity. Uh, while making a great point of baptism, he observed that there are different understanding, both historically and in different churches and traditions, how to understand the rule of confirmation in Christian initiation. His own suggestion to the divided churches is to understand baptism in water and the name of the triune God, followed by the laying on of hand as the full initiation. While the ceremony of confirmation, he thinks, ought to be understood as a consecration of the laity for adult service in the church, but that confirmation should be seen as placed outside of the Christian initiation, that on baptism. 
the Eucharist is at the very center in Turion's theological reflection. And he writes that um, divided Christian can have no stronger desire than to attain the same Eucharistic communion with one and the same Eucharistic faith. Turion is, in his early writings, a strong advocate for intercommunion. He criticized the Roman Catholic Church, both for not permitting its faithful to receive communion in other churches and for not allowing Christians from other churches to receive communion in the Roman Catholic Church. However, he also criticizes Protestants for practicing intercommunion without committing themselves to working seriously for the restoration of Christian unity. And he gives several suggestions as to how the Roman Catholic Church could soften its often and uh, its refusal and uh, non-practice of intercommunion, as well as overcoming its difficulty to recognize that it is the same Eucharist that is celebrated in that church as in the other churches, even though these other churches may lack the office of bishop. Turion encourages the Rome Reformed Church to teach about and to celebrate the Eucharist in a way that a Roman Catholic Church can take seriously. These double strategies are possible to understand respectively as expressions of what I call applied Catholicity and created Catholicity. The first signifies Turion's challenge to the Roman Catholic Church to recognize the Eucharistic faith and practice that could make intercommunion possible within Protestant churches. The second signified Turion's challenge to the Reformed churches, to renew their <coughs> Eucharistic life so that the Roman Catholic Church could more easily recognize the Eucharistic practice and faith they practice themselves in other churches. Promoting Christian unity, Turion also seeks to foster doctrinal convergence on the Eucharist between the Reformed churches and the Roman Catholic Church. This is revealed primarily in his reflection on the meaning of the concept of memorial in the memorial in the institution narratives in the New Testament. Um, so he says when, uh, when, when Christ says do this in memory of me, he, he, what he says is do this as a memorial for me. He's saying more than uh, just remember me when you do this. And, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he works in this book exegetically. He sees that um, when the New Testament uses um, uh, the, the word anamnesis, memorial, it is, it is in the Old Testament or in the Septuagint. But when, when, these, when, the, when these words are used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it is um, the, it's an amnesis of and it's sikaron and sakar and uh, and if sikar sikaron is in, in translated into um, into uh, Greek, it's an amnesis of, of nemosunon. And his and his point is that um, uh, using this biblical way of seeing what the word actually means makes it possible to have a sacrificial understanding of what what is meant by the word um, do this as a memorial of me. Um, Turion is also able to formulate a Eucharistic theology that is able to unite divided churches in a way that was not possible before. He has also um, and he also works with, with the question of, of real presence, uh, saying that there are different models how to, to, to understand the real presence, uh, but he comes to the point to say that we, should, that we could be united in that there is a real presence, not necessarily how this presence is to be understood. And that makes, that he, he, he downplays a little um, the, the, the role of the term transubstantiation. Well, Turion, and combined with this um, 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 theological work, he also produces, as I said, liturgical texts that according to him could be used in different churches 
expressing the same liturgical understanding. Mm -hmm. And in this uh, Ben document, uh, when it was um, accepted, he, he was challenged to, to, to make a service, the Lima liturgy, that could be a liturgical way to celebrate the convergences among churches. So he produced a liturgical order for the Mass uh, that, could that, could be, that could be used by Christians in different churches and denominations and thus um, say if we could celebrate, if we could use the same liturgical text, that is a step for us to come closer on the way to unity. Uh, but there is a question that hinders unity at the Lord's table, and that is the fact that the Roman Catholic Church is not very willing to accept Eucharist as fully valid, if it's not presided over by a bishop or priest ordained within the apostolic succession, as it is defined in the Roman Catholic canon law. As a theologian within the Reformed tradition, Turion makes the claim that even though the Reformed churches lack the office of bishops ordained within apostolic succession, the ministers of these churches are successors of the apostles, and when they, as a group of pastors, perform ordination, they are acting as a collective bishop. Turion argues that the Roman Catholic Church ought to recognize the ministerial orders of the Reformed churches. The Reformed ministers are ordered within a presbyteral succession. This ordination resembles and may very be compared to historical examples of ordinations performed by Roman Catholic priests. There are examples in the Roman Church that other than bishops have performed ordinations to the priesthood with a papal dispensation. At the same time as Turion challenges the Roman Catholic Church to recognize holy orders in Reformed churches, he encourages the Reformed churches to appreciate the meaning of the office of bishop and to reintroduce it. He even suggests that while waiting for this to be done, bishops should be invited to take part in ordinations in non-episcopal churches. As a Roman Catholic, Turion tends only to stress the importance of apostolic succession but not encourage a wider understanding of ministry as he did before. In my dissertation, um, I discuss Turion's understanding of the Bishop of Rome. More obvious than in earlier chapters of this dissertation, the chapter of papacy uh, presents a development in Turion's understanding. And this development can be summarized that in his early writings, he accepts that in the early church, the Bishop of Rome had a practical primacy, but this does not include the idea of papal infallibility. Later, Turion takes a step further and expresses that the idea that in a future reunited church, the Bishop of Rome could have the role as a leader of the whole church. But this time, Turion also expresses the idea that in a reunited church, a truly, as you say, a truly ecumenical council could be convened, and that such a council, the understanding of um, the papacy as it expressed at the First Vatican Council, could be revised. I believe, actually, that Josef Ratzinger had similar ideas uh, that in regards, in the relation to, to the Orthodox Church, that uh, the, and for a right way to unity, that the Orthodox Church would not be demanded to accept other councils than, than, than the seven which you already accept. Mm -hmm. In my dissertation, let me see. Yeah, yeah. And, um, it, and later in his life, he, 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 in 1977, 10 years before he became a Roman Catholic, he defends the idea that it's not, you can say more than, than saying that in the early church the Bishop of Rome was something and that in the future he can be something. He says that he also believed that the patrial ministry, even though it could be reformed, but still is actually practiced in his contemporary Roman Catholic Church. And the last text that Turion writes about is this. Um, um, encyclical letter Udunum Sint on the commitment to ecumenism. And then whether he was a sort of ghostwriter or not, 
he, he, he expressed in Orchard of Sabonatus that here something very interesting happened. The Pope invites members of other churches to reflect with him on the role of the Pope in a reunited church. And whether or not Turian was the ghostwriter of this encyclica, here is given an opportunity to approach the papacy, affirming its ecumenical value, being able to give words to or critique of how it is exercised today, as Turian earlier in his authorship had suggested. Still, the invitation to an ecumenical dialogue must be considered as an invitation of great, great value worth following up. Um, in my dissertation, I also discuss Mariology, and I note that Turian's text on Mary um, also signifies uh, development just as in his text on the papacy. In the early writings, of, he, he is critical towards Roman Catholic Mariology, and particular to the dogma of Mary's assumption to heavenly body and soul, which was promulgated in 1950. Turian considers the assumption as a speculation on matters where both scripture and early tradition are silent. According to Turion, this dogma, together with the entire Roman Mariology, places Mary outside the normal conditions of human life. Yet he insists that Mary is to be remembered and honored by the church, particularly by celebrating her feast days. That's what he says in his early writings. In 1962, one, he writes a book, Marie, Mère du Seigneur, Figure de l'Église, and I think it's called in the English, Mary, Mother of the Lord, figure of the church. And that was, um, represents a new development in his Mariology. He approaches Mariology from a different angle. He meditates on what scripture says about Mary and on how Mary is an image of the church. This text represents a way of presenting an ecumenical and biblical approach to Mariology that could unite the churches without polemics. Here Tarian does not discuss the Roman Catholic doctrines of the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption. Um, but in his book that I mentioned to, that expresses a sort of him coming closer to Roman Catholic tradition uh, is the Tradition et Renouveau dans l'Esprit, or Source de l'Église. It's not translated into English, uh, but the, the title's meaning is Tradition and Renewal in the Spirit to the source of the church. Turion expresses here an acceptance of the Roman Catholic Mariology and not only considers Mary to be an image of the mother of the church, but also sees her as the mother of Christians. Turion also expresses openness to the idea of addressing um, prayers to Mary, asking her to pray for us. This last uh, change was brought about that he can say it I think he's brought about both by the Vatican Council and what the Faith and Order said on, in Montreal. Uh, both there are there were produced documents that overcome a sort of a dichotomy between scripture and tradition, because he had said that um, that the Roman Catholic Mariology cannot be defended from scripture alone, but he saw that in the ecumenical dialogue a change has been brought about in both Roman Catholic and Reformed churches that, that both uh, traditions were given a new perspective to approach doctrinal issue, uh, thus making a convergence that did not exist before possible. And, um, and that has to do with the idea of understanding scripture as a part of tradition and tradition as the life of the scripture in the church. In Turion's Mariological Reflections, I note two, note two valuable things. One is that there is quite a strong Mariology present among the Reformers, um, and, and, and he presents that, and others have done it as well, but that's often forgotten in Protestant tradition, what they actually say. And what they actually say about Mary is more than most Protestant church have done, at least until recently. And he also says that the balanced discussion on the relation of scripture and tradition can help us in an, to in, in an ecumenical spirit appreciate the importance of the Blessed Virgin in the work of salvation. This was what I was saying about 
the book, uh, and this is about the questions I deal with. Uh, and uh, it has been very interesting for me writing it because it has um, helped me to think on central issues in the Christian faith, but also uh, how things can can uh, how these issues can be discussed in ecumenical dialogue. But so at last, I would um, I have what I do in, the, in my book as well that I have uh, what I've done now is that I have presented some observations I have made studying the ecumenical theology of Max Turian. In the last chapter of my dissertation, I reflect on what might be the legacy of Max Turian to a future generation of ecumenical theologians. And my answer to that question is fourfold. First, uh, Turian, I mentioned Turian's passion for the restoration of Christian unity. For him, visible unity of the church is not a kind of optional extra, but is a wish to realize the prayer of Christ that they all may be one. And this is the passion of his life, and that is something he can be a role model for us in having. And the second legacy of Turian is the importance of taking truth and doctrinal convergence seriously. Turian wishes a unity that consists in mutual recognition of math practice, sharing in the Eucharist and, and the exchangeability of ordained ministry and forms of exercising authority recognized by all. This unity is a unity that demands a common understanding of the divine revelation and its interpretation. Turian's vision of Christian unity is a unity that is more, it's more than a recognition of baptism and the court that we could do good things together. Um, he, and I think that's something important for our time, not least to not to forget the vision of this <coughs> unity, which I sometimes think in modern humanism is not, um, is sort of pushed into the background. And, and the third aspect uh, is that Turian's interests concerns unity with the See of Peter and his writing from all the stations of his authorship can help us to discuss with the Roman Catholic Church and among Christians how could the Pope in a reunited church exercise the primacy of honour that the early church described as a presiding in charity that could be recognised by all Christians. And the fourth legacy of Turian is that his work for unity um, makes uh, the liturgical renewal as an integral part for the visible unity. And the ecumenical vision has to inform those who work with, with, with had to inform the liturgists. Because when Turian formulated dogmatics text on the Eucharist, he took part in the work of renewal at Tessy. And it is obvious that these two activities were not isolated from one another, but on the contrary, influenced and fertilized one another. The renewed liturgical orders described the Eucharist in a way that created an understanding of what the church does in the celebration of the Eucharist, while the celebration of the Eucharist itself was a practice of, was a practice of the content of the Eucharistic faith. Turian believed that the surest way for Christians to become one and the, one and the same Eucharistic communion with the same Eucharistic faith was that the churches, each by themselves, would lead a Eucharistic life that expressed the fullness of Christian faith. The importance of interplay between the search for unity between the churches and the liturgical renewal and deepening insights into their own ecclesial tradition is a bequest that Max Turian has handed on to new generation of Christians like him want to work for the visible unity of all Christians. Mm -hmm. I stop there. Uh, thank you for the lecture, Father. I, I would like to know, um, could you tell us a little bit about the state of communion between the Protestant churches, the various Protestant denominations in, in, in Europe specifically? Uh, so between the Anglican Church and the Nordic Lutheran churches, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I mean, uh, during the, 
the, the, the, the, the 20th century, that we, we, we start with the Church of Sweden and, and, and the Church of England, we have actually, we have, we have only lived a little isolated from one another, uh, and uh, there had not been very much contact, but, but that happened uh, not least uh, in the 19, in the 1920s, there was um, uh, there was an agreement of intercommunion between the Church of England and the, the Church of Sweden, and there was a Swedish young theologian then uh, who later uh, who later became the Archbishop, and he visited frequently Pusey House. His name was Ingrid Riliot, uh, and uh, and he has also presented uh, Anglo-Catholicism to Swedish readers mm -hmm. just 100 years ago. Uh, and, and I mean, that, that has been followed up, this, uh, that in the late, I think it was 95, there was made an agreement of, uh, of should say, full communion and interchangeability of ministers uh, in, between the church, between the, the Scandinavian Lutheran churches and, and the Anglican churches, mm -hmm. uh, and that means, for example, that I, it makes possible what will happen tomorrow, tomorrow morning, if I will say mass in, in the chapel, uh, it, it's possible thanks to, uh, to that. And um, I mean, uh, there there are, that there are also among the Protestant churches different kinds of um, uh, relations. In in one way, all Lutheran churches have, have said they have things um, they have a relatedness together, and there is, and some Protestant churches have, some but sometimes this can make a problem uh, because, for and the Church of Sweden can sometimes be criticised for because we are happy to have uh, intercommunion and interchangeability with ministers of ministers with some churches that, for example, the Church of England have not because our our agreement with. Um, uh, with the Church of England has lots to do with with bishops, but uh, but but some but Church of Sweden can sometimes have uh, agreements with churches who do not have the office of bishops in that sense. Was that an answer to your question, or did or did I just? Yes, I, so I think so far. Yes. I think so far. Yes. Um, go ahead. Um, something you brought up, which I hadn't realized before, was how thinking about a certain kind of ecumenism can clarify other parts of Christian theology. For instance, it sounded like Max Furian clarified some of his own thoughts on dogma, doctrine, and opinion, and changed which things went into which category while he was thinking about uh, ecumenism uh, in terms of uh, Mariology, for instance, mm -hmm. which, uh, but also in terms of practice, things that are necessary liturgically, things that are good liturgically, and things that are, are optional or, or maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered if you, I've always come across ecumenism in context of people who were moving away from strong commitments of belief and practice. It gets fu it got fuzzy in the context, and that can be just my experience uh, with it. I haven't had much experience with Pazé, for, um, uh, for instance. But have you found it useful, and could you point us to some others who've been thinking about ecumenism in a way that has helped to strengthen and make more believable the dogmatics of Christian faith or the things that are really necessary bits of the liturgy that we should look toward as, our, as, as the work of the people, as it were? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, well, what you mentioned, if you started in, with, with the liturgy, uh, what's called liturgical movement in uh, that that is mainly in the in, in the Roman Catholic Church in fact I mean it's present in, in all churches even in, in, among the Orthodox uh, say for example Alexander Schmemann as, as he writes uh, by uh, about the, the, the Eucharist um, uh, one, one can see that it is sort of interesting in the early church uh, what, uh, what it was how its liturgy was presented and I think, for example, that Max Turion can, can help us to come out from a discussion that's either or, uh, because I think one can say, say if, if Roman Catholics might, might disagree with me, but that in the medieval church it was an overemphasis on the sacrificial nature of, of the Mass. Um, and uh, and uh, but on the other hand, the, the, the reformers 
were, were so critical towards this understanding that it, that, 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 that it almost just took away every aspect of, uh, of, of, of sacrifice. And I think a sort of reading the fathers and renewing um, the liturgical texts and using the use of liturgical prayers of different kind um, could help us to to together find a balanced um, understanding of of the Eucharist, and I believe that that, that Max Turiano Fisk had been a part of that, both in his liturgical work and, and in his dogmatic to um, to to find um, uh, to, to find a, a, a vision and an understanding of the Eucharist that that could be shared and be, could be a foundation for for a Eucharistic fellowship, and I think. Turion would not say that it was that ecumenism would be a sort of passing nothing really matters. It would be, we just hold hands and love one another a little, uh, like that, um, which it might have been from time to time. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a risk today, um, and I could feel, for example, among some Roman Catholics, that they want to go back to a very um, both to a very traditional liturgy. Which, which has its value, no, no doubt, but, um, but, but it's sort to say it's important to be strengthened in, 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 their, in your own identity and, and to stay away from further ecumenism could be a part of that, and that I think is a, a risky bit. So I think Turion could be a corrective both for those who are too conservative and for those who are too liberal. That's my point of view. And uh, okay, we'll go uh, here and here. Uh, did Julian or his associates or followers do any work on the reasons for the divisions in the church in the Christian world over the centuries? Uh, if you have an illness, you try to find out how the illness happened, how it originated, what was the cause of it, mm -hmm. in order to overcome it. Has any work been done on mm -hmm. trying to understand and pin down the reasons why again and again divisions have occurred in yes. the Christian world uh, over the centuries. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think one, 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 one can sense so, and I think that when Turian tries to, as, as I mean, Turian had also relation with, with the Orthodox Church and they, they met the Patriarch Aconagoras and so, but, but yes, to take some example, um, is that we are, uh, he, he could sometimes say that in the way the Roman Catholic express aspects of the faith and the church life in the medievals uh, may the, the Protestant criticism very much understandable and, uh, and, and to, to say, to, to affirm uh, that this could have been the reasons, and sometimes uh, he could say that Protestants criticized, for example, if we go back to the question of the sacrificial nature of, of the Eucharist, uh, they criticized a caricature of the Roman Catholic doctrine, that is, that sometimes the Roman Catholic believe in themselves, and uh, and and to overcome this division could, could be done by, by taking a step back and, and try to understand and sometimes go a little back in history uh, and not an analyze everything in late medieval terms. Well, is that the sort of answer? Thank you. Oh. Yeah, thank you. I'm still trying to form the question a little bit from what you two uh, have said, but would he have said that as you touched on, that, that, that the issue really was that Protestants and Catholics were opposing caricatures of their position, or would he say there were fundamental differences in the theology of, let's say, justification that drive the Eucharistic mm -hmm. practice mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed at the biblical exegetical level? Because mm -hmm. occasionally when you were speaking, it was, it was almost as if, well, I can produce a liturgy that both sides can read into their theology and therefore be comfortable celebrating which seems to be quite a 
a superficial humanism yeah. level, would he, would he, yeah, what did he think theologically? Did he think that, that this was just a, a, a misreading and a caricature of each other, and that if we just understood each other a little better, we'd realise we were both saying the same things, but the rhetoric got overheated at the reputation? Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, if one would make a caricature of the Arturian, that, 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 that could, I, I mean, I, it, it could be so. And he was, he was really passionate to, to overcome such divisions. Uh, but I also would say that he, I think that he did not believe <coughs> that there is a fundamental uh, difference or divisions. And um, as sometimes uh, uh, in, we, we, I, I, I myself in the Lutheran tradition, that sometimes it has been said that, as you know, mentioned, the, the question of justification is um, a fundamental difference. And the Lutherans have sometimes said that, uh, um, that that we uh, that, that that we believe differently on, on these issues. Uh, is it grace alone, or is it grace combined with, with good deeds? Uh, well, but I think Turian and not him alone. For example, um, Hans Kuhn, uh, who, who, who who died quite recently. Uh, now well, he was very guys seen as a very liberal Roman Catholic theologian, but he was he was a friend of Joseph Ratzinger in, in the old days, and they were both involved in ecumenical theology. And what Ratzinger uh, what, what Hans Kuhn said on justification, it was, if I remember correctly, right, is that Roman Catholics don't make a clear distinction between justification and sanctification, while Lutheran may, makes a very very strict distinction. Because a Lutheran would say, of course, in sanctification, then we have to do some cooperations. And, and, and therefore, and this way, it's also present in the, in the agreement between the Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church on justification that, that came in 95. That, uh, and, and then we're working that we are maybe, we are talking through one another uh, and, and, and the Reformation time, and, and that there is, a way to, to to reconcile even the, even these differences, and I, I think that that is Turian's legacy. But of course, there, there will be uh, people who criticize him. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to follow up some of this by saying that um, this is all that made me think of a faculty member of my own university, University of St. Andrews, who sadly just passed away, but um, really pushed ecumenism as a dialogue yeah. amongst both Catholics and various Protestants, uh, Christoph Sprobel, yeah. who, um, and, and also between different religions, based on sort of first the, the idea of God as revelation in, in Trinitarian relationship, and so relationship is this necessity of dialogue. And so in a, in a theological setting, it's hard to say, I mean, I don't know if this is quite uh, analogous to the idea of sort of moving toward liturgy, but at the very least, you know, um, in St. Andrews, there was a very rich, that I was able to watch happen, dialogue between Catholic theologians uh, and Protestant theologians of various stripes, including Lutheran and, and Reformed. And, uh, and so I think, I mean, I would say that I think it's very possible for that sort of dialogue to happen and for there to be serious, or at least established differences that don't descend into sort of a, an emptiness or a meaninglessness, but that are taken seriously and yet there is common ground that's found. So that's the first thing. I wanted to actually ask a follow-up about, about Turian. Um, thinking about his conversion and sort of the value of his vision and, and wondering if, in a sense, if one were to sort of think about his conversion to Catholicism, would one, would he, do you think he would want us more to think of it as something that was, was a process we should think of for ourselves in that uh, ultimately he comes to sort of a reconciliation with these various ideas or it, do you think there's there's a sense in which it does undercut or sort of at least um, modify some of his some of his sort of hermeneutical approaches? Yes. Yeah, I, I mean the, the very fact that he becomes a Roman Catholic makes him in one sense less interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that that, 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 that this was certain. Uh, but and I think and I write it also in my dissertation that I don't think the value of Turion is a sort of help for. Protestants to become Roman Catholics, but, but I, uh, 
uh, because then, then there have been there are other things I could write about. But uh, but I think but I think that his theology actually on on all stages in his life could have an input on ecumenical dialogue. Um, uh, and and his and his reason to become a Roman Catholic, it seems as if, and and also the fact that he did it a little secretly, uh, that it it has to do with, with with himself and other things, and that he wanted to leave, um, he would leave to the to the to the church still his ecumenical vision. And in fact, when when I met Julian, then he, he uh, when I was a conference with him together with then Cardinal Ratzinger. Uh, I remember the conversation that Max Turian uh, made a comment, and he started. He, had, he was a Roman Catholic priest and a theologian, and he started his, for us from the Reformed tradition, he started. <laughs> <laughs> he started his argument. Uh, so, so I think he he he, he still uh, believed that that his uh, that, that his theological work actually could, um, could could bring churches closer to one another. And uh, so it's not, it's not a denouncing of his previous work. That uh, is not how he, he understands himself when he become, became a Roman Catholic. That was very interesting because I was thinking about the same. I was trying to think of how to ask that same question, which you've just answered in the sense of does he does he become for for the reformed. Christian, does one say, well, actually, he, he can't really help us now because obviously the whole time yeah. this unity wasn't really about a dialogue. Mm -hmm. He was simply going in one direction. But what you're, you're saying that he is a kind of reformed vision even as even when he becomes a Catholic priest. I think, yeah, but I mean, that, that, that I mean, I mean, you, you speak of my, even being in a many ways an admirer of many aspects of the Roman Catholic tradition there is of course a problem of symmetry as uh, which, which was clear to me in something completely different I read the other day is that for for Anglicans for example it's very clearly expressed that our church is in itself incomplete we are a part of the one holy Catholic Church worshiping the one uh, God Father Son and Holy Spirit we are a part of it and we we join but the Roman Catholic Church, so to say, in some ways, so we, we are, we, the, the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. It's, it's already there. And we could be enriched a little if, if other come in, in, but not in a fundamental way. And I think uh, I think the Roman Catholic Church, if they said, we have almost all the fullness, but we will be enriched a little bit by your prayer, by, by your coming to, to us. Uh, you will get very much from us, and we a little from you. I, I would have it much easier. Uh, Can I ask that really quick? Yeah, um, Eucharistic, uh, uh, Eucharistic centrality rather than biblical centrality, or, or mm -hmm. does that become the big distinction between amongst Protestants between whether they would take to be able to take Turian's vision seriously? I, I, I find that. Um, the dividing line amongst Christians I meet is often between sacramentality and non-sacramentality, -sacr rather, rather, rather than, as an emphasis, rather than between uh, some of the other historical divisions. And this is, I think, becoming more and more apparent as many of the church, historic churches are becoming less committed to their own historic belief, mm -hmm. and more likeness is being found among some persons within each of them. And so, certain Lutherans, certain Anglicans. Catholics and others say, oh yes, we all have a sacramental vision of the world that includes the Bible, obviously. And then there's another set of churches that have a very biblically central, centric vision of the world. Does Turian have something for them as well, the biblically centered uh, Christians? I don't really know what I should point to that, but, 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 but I think it's, but I think the method that he makes dialogue could help us also to, to, to address this question because when we say that we because if you are very eucharistic centered i mean i mean that is um, uh, to share the eucharist is, is is so to say then we are that nothing demonstrates more clearly that we are that we are we are christ church we are the body of christ manifesting that together but if you have uh, but, but for others 
who is very centered on the word and the teaching of the word, and, and, and then the Eucharist does not play the same role, and they don't really understand. I mean, uh, if we can hear one another's sermons, why can't we receive communion? Because communion is just a sort of visible illustration of what is proclaimed. Uh, and, uh, and, but I think in his vision is, of course, a very centrality of, 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 of the Eucharist. The, the, he says in one point, the church is never more itself. It's never as much itself when, than when it say, celebrates the Eucharist. Um, I, it's my understanding that um, Brother Roger, as a pastor himself, um, celebrated the Eucharist, you know, took part in the celebrations in the early days of the Tese community. But um, as I understand it, when uh, Roman Catholic brothers began to join, mm. he was not allowed to give them communion. Mm. And at some point, he decided that as prior, mm. if he could not celebrate for, every, for, for, the, for the whole community, he would not celebrate at all. So by the time I went to Tese in the, in the 70s, he was not uh, among those who celebrated. Mm. The Eucharist. I take it that Max Turian wouldn't be in quite the same position because he wasn't prior. Yeah. Uh, but presumably he went on celebrating. Can you just comment on that? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, because you, 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 because it is very good that you, you're here because you, you are, you are talking about a sort of middle period that I have not really studied because I have studied the early days of Tessie and, and and have been there now. So now in the days, I mean, it's uh, yeah, what is done. Uh, on Sundays, it's a Roman Catholic mass said, and at the morning prayers, there's the distribution of uh, of um, the consecrated bread and wine, I think, uh, uh, consecrated in a Roman Catholic mass. And it's 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 a little unclear if you don't know every every, every details. There and maybe been, there have been a number of iterations which will keep yes, uh, yes. But, but 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 I think uh, that, that this might happen that that. Uh, that at some point they have started to, to this to the communal um, celebration of the Eucharist is um, is Roman Catholic, uh, but I know that there are some of the brethren who are Reformed pastors even today that 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 that, that meets and celebrates uh, the, the, the the Eucharist in the, in. Uh, in, well, not to Roman Catholic past, but to the Reformed Eucharist. So that happened, but, but I think that's true that, that Brother Roger took, so to say, a step back from him being the pastor in his idea being, of being the prior. Yeah. So in the early 70s, there was always Anglican, mm -hmm. um, an Anglican celebration at, at the same time, simultaneously. Yes. With the with the, uh, the, the the red of one, which became the main one, I think, when there was a declaration by the Catholic bishops in France yes. that um, that this would be an ecumenical occasion and everyone could mm. receive, that yeah. was what changed. But when the Anglican uh, bread and wine mm. was distributed, there was always a long queue of not Anglicans coming mm. to get the Anglican wine. <laughs> 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 Yeah, uh, uh, I, I think that, that, that that's a bit because, but there were some reflections also in President Fillon's writings of how can we do a communal uh, celebration. Uh, and he had the idea of that, that, that priests from different churches could concelebrate and or celebrate simultaneously. So they had they had they had a, they had many experiments that I find. Today and that, uh, where the Roman Catholic Church is a little more strict, but, but it's quite interesting that the, the, the liturgy of Octesi was uh, Roman Catholic bishop said this text uh, is is okay to be used even by a Roman Catholic priest to say mass, so, and, and, that, and that is of course something in, that illustrates that 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 we have orders of the service that reflects. An understanding of the of the sacrament, so that we technically could use it in, in both our churches. Father Jacob, uh, I'd like to thank you for not only a very.